Okay. So right. what a great group, 40, 43 wow. people. Wow. Paul, well, well, you I'll, are popular, sorry. I'm gonna jump in and just start, okay? Six, 603. Welcome everyone. It's very exciting to have um, 40 plus people here. It's just great. Um, I'm Mary Beth. I'm, I'm um, president of Pastel Society and, and I welcome you. We all welcome you. Um, several of our board members are present tonight and um, I'm just gonna um, welcome you to the Pastel Society calendar for a few minutes and just remind you of what's coming up and, um, and a couple other things. And um, I, um, in our calendar, we have, this is the first night of our uh, weekday wine and watch and Polly's uh, giving us her wonderful presentation tonight, which she says she has um, updated and expanded and Tonight is its maiden flight as a as a fresh a new work, so it should be fun. Um, in our next uh, weekday wine and watch will be February sixteenth with Aline Ordman, and you can watch your email for you know the link, but also for the subject matter. And then in March sixteenth is Wednesday, and we'll have. Andrew McDermott, he's from Pacific Northwest. He's wonderful. And um, he will, as I said, watch your email for those links. And our last one is on April 13th, that's a Wednesday, and it's Tara Will. If you've ever seen Tara paint, it is experience. She's bright and very fresh, very young, and should be a, a really, you know, it's really interesting. I mean, everyone's interesting to watch them paint, but um, each of these people has very unique style. I want to also say that um, Polly's presentation tonight is kind of a, her intro to um, a, a workshop that she does on the subject of abstracting. And we are gonna have the pleasure of Polly's giving a two or three day up in September and watch for more information about that. We will probably start taking registration around um, April and May, okay? That will probably take place in the Portland area and um, we're just searching for the proper venue for it. I am very pleased to acknowledge all the membership renewals we've had and some brand new members and welcome all of them. It's wonderful. We like to get memberships um, tidied up by the end of G January, though they kind of trickle in all year. Thank you very much for supporting Pastel Society with your membership. Um, I have two announcements to make and one is um, Terry Lynn Dubroy, our website, social media wonder girl is asking that um, our members would please send new images to be used on um, Facebook, Instagram, and the web. She always needs to work and would love to um, feature you um, and your work. <laughs> get credit for any work that she posts. To do that, send your images in um, JPEG form or in an email to Terry Lynn through the Pastel Society of Maine at Gmail uh, email. And that, that will work really well. Um, we are still seeking a few uh, volunteers for positions and for works that we want to accomplish in uh, Pastel Society of Maine. So um, we need um, a worker to come and help for the juried exhibition that we do in September. I'm and I'm really open to you. <laughs> it's, 
just a lot of little pieces that need doing and we need um we need someone to help with the signature member show that is coming up in may and june at hear this postal main botanical gardens in booth bay to be very special and we'll have some special events going on with that and if you have big idea you want to see us do let's talk about it you can always email and and uh or contact any of us and we're we'd love to talk so at this point i'm going to turn it over to terry Lindbray, who has our wine terry. Yeah. Also, the Guy Benson Show on Fox Radio. Susan Page, Washington Bureau Chief. Somebody has their, um, I think I got TV it. On. I think I got it. Just a moment, I got to let a couple of people in. Okay. All right. Um, play Spotlight. I got to do all these things. So this evening, as I sent out, our wine tonight is Merlot. Um, I usually ask the artists what they prefer, but... Polly does not drink, so that's understandable. I took my old picture of uh, another picture, but Merlot is a dark purple, blue purple varietal. It's used often as a blender, but it's also often on its own. Now the word Merlot in French actually means blackbird. And in France, the best region for Merlot is from the Medoc region, and that's down near Bordeaux which is a southwestern part of France. And it's very popular in Bordeaux blends. Almost every Bordeaux blend has Merlot in it, as well as Cab Sauvignon and uh, Malbec or other things like that. Now, a lot of us have heard about Merlot that oh, it might not be that great a wine because the movie Sideways, if you've ever seen that, which was back a couple of decades, the guy was looking for the best Pinot Noir in the world and he was traveling everywhere and he was dissing or putting down Merlot. But Merlot is the second most popular grape and wine in the world. It has a nice medium body. It's got a balance of acid and the alcohol strength. Uh, the fruits normally that people can detect and you don't add fruit to it, it's just trace chemical compounds that happen during fermentation and aging are plum, blackberry, maybe some black raspberry, and some sort of like light leafy greens or spinachy kind of thing, but those are very, very subtle. The wine that I have tonight, my um, Merlot, is a uh, Balaton Bulgari, which is from Hungary, but bottled in California actually, but it's a Hungarian wine. And for pairings, you want something that has quite a bit of body. The pairing with food, what it does for red, red wine, especially that often has strong tannins or that, that dryness that people get, that's from the astringent on the outside of the grape skin when the grape is growing to protect it from being eaten. And that gets processed into the wine. And it actually helps the wine to age and it adds a lot well, of watch, oxygen that benefit us. Um, so by adding wine with food, if you have like a rich, maybe mid hard cheese, like a, a medium cheddar, something like that, <clears throat> you can have this with black fruit that kind of complements the fruit tastes that are in it. And another great thing to have is a dark chocolate. I have some dark sea salt caramels that I get from Trader Joe's, which are really nice to have with this. Uh, when you you're hungry. Uh, yeah, I know. <laughs> when serving um, a red wine, it's best to have it, they say, at room temperature, but room temperature can't be like at Mary Beth's room temperature right now. Room temperature means about 65 degrees. If you start getting up in the 70s and 80s, it is just too hot, and you might actually need to chill the wine a little bit. So <clears> you want it about 65 degrees. And when you go to enjoy it, it's nice to test the wine first, give it a good swirl. This releases the oxygen and the volatile chemicals. Get your nose in and breathe deeply and do that a few times. And that 
helps you to taste the wine better because two thirds of our taste is actually in our retronasal passages, the aromas of the food. If you hold your nose and taste something, you're not really gonna taste it. You're gonna get bitter, salty, sugary, things like that, but you're not gonna get those flavors. That comes from our sense of smell. So you swirl it, you sniff it really well, sip it and then savor it and enjoy it for the evening. If you have any questions, mm -hmm. let me know. But that's, I'm actually now I'm training to be a wine judge. I don't know why, it's just kind of something fun to do. <laughs> mm -hmm. So I'm gonna send it now back to Mary Beth. Thank you, Terry Lynn. You may always make it sound so divinely delicious. So <laughs> <Yes. thank you. laughs> nice experience. That's the proper way to um, enjoy your wine. So tonight we'll have Polly Castor, who lives in oh, Connecticut. Oh, 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 oh. You need, when are you going to draw? <gasps> oh, oh yes. you, Laura. Yay, Laura. <laughs> Laura, you're the best. Um, OK, Laura Beckering has, is our membership uh, gal. And she's um, going to tonight to draw the winner of our incentive for uh, re-upping membership or, or signing up for membership and our, um, our gift to um, some lucky person is um, a $50 gift certificate to Dakota Pastel, the best website for anything pastel. I'm sorry, mm -hmm. Laura, and thank you for interrupting me Okay. And the winner is Kathleen Sutherland, Portland. Oh, Kathleen, <laughs> wonderful. Oh, she's not here tonight. <laughs> but that's well, she'll be through. Who it is? Hey. Excellent. Yay. Nice. She'll okay. Be Laura. Right, Laura, do you, you can... want to think about membership? Oh, I think it's great that so many people have re-upped so early awesome. and, and there's still time. Somebody just did it while we were, while uh, Terry Lynn was um, making her wine presentation. So uh, something just came in. So that's great. great. Thank you. Thank you, everybody. Thank you for the good work you do. How many thanks. members? How many members do we have, Laura? Well, if uh, right now, if this this one that just came in, we are at eighty eight out of last year. We ended with one hundred and twenty four, so we're at eighty eight renewals. Thank you. Super. Thank you. Excellent. Excellent. Yeah, we're thrilled with that. Um, so, moving on, we will. Um, like to welcome Polly Castor now. She is a, a wonderful friend from Connecticut who is involved with um, several art organizations, I believe, but also with the Pastel, has been associated with the Pastel Society of Connecticut. Um, Polly is a painter um, extraordinaire who ha does really large work in Pastel and in other medium, I think. And she has been known to mount a one person show with 77 new works in one year. And that is like amazing. Polly's strength is um, abstract and she is really creative, very creative. Polly does a blog daily and the blog is about, uh, I might say 14 years old. She'll correct me if I'm wrong. She does it every day. And the thing is a um, thing of edification and wonder and beauty and color. It's wonderful. So I first met Polly at a workshop that we had given, which was with Jen Evenhoos. We were at Ferry Beach in Saco and um, Polly came to that and we had a great time at that workshop. It was an indoor several day workshop right on the beach, but we worked hard and had a blast. 
And then Polly came again to our spring retreat last year in Southport Island and in June. And she was a wonderful asset there, very encouraging, full of joy. So I hope that you enjoy her presentation. It's, it's really special and she does know what she's talking about. And I, and I say, take it away, Polly. Okay, hi everybody. Um, I'm so glad you're here. Thank you for coming. And I'm gonna just start sharing my screen here. All righty. All righty. So the title of my talk is Abstraction Between Impressionism and Non-Objective Art. I'm really gr grateful to be here. I wanted to mention that everything you see in this slideshow, I've either painted or taken the original photography. So it's all my work. So I wanna be sure everybody can hear me. Um, I wanted to ask you all to mute yourself. Uh, feel free to unmute if you wanna ask a question, but please mute again so that uh, everyone can hear everything. And I also wanted to be mentioned that um, there have been uh, handouts mailed out. Um, the handouts aren't needed for the presentation, but they're a supplement to it for, especially for you afterwards. Uh, what they are are two pages of, of quotes that you'll see that I'm not the only one saying these kind of things that famous artists throughout time have said these things. And um, the other one is some jumping off ideas for you to put into practice the things that I've talked about so that um, I know you're going to be all excited by the end of this uh, presentation. So I wanted you to be able to run with it right away. And on that second one, there's also my contact information if you are interested in uh, finding my art online or joining my blog or finding me out on Instagram or whatever. So let's just jump right in. Um, let's, I'm going to start with a few quotes. This is a real favorite from Aristotle. The aim of art is to represent not the outward appearance of things, but their inward significance. Now that's front and central to everything I'll be saying this evening. It's not about the outward appearance of things. It's their inward significance. I wanted to talk a minute about my mom my, my mother was a fine artist and she was a watercolorist. Um, I grew up doing pastel my whole life. We, I was in every national park in the lower 48 in, before I was 18. She uh, plein air painted in watercolor and I was with her and it was easy for her to bring along pastel for me. And I'd sit next to her, I wouldn't get into her watercolors that way. And so I've been literally painting in pastel my whole life. Um, my mother, uh, taught me this key thing. She says to me over and over and over again that copying is not art. So basically the translation there is it's not about making it look photorealistic and exactly like it looks like because copying is not art. If you're doing that, it's not art, it's technique. Um, the other thing that was interesting about having my mom as an artist was we had a whole wall of art books in our home and she had them in order chronologically. So the really ancient stuff was at the top of the list and at the top of the shelf and at the very bottom of the shelf was all the modern stuff. So as a little kid, I could only reach the modern books. So I, as a little kid, poured over Kandinsky and the likes. And this was also extremely formative. So I would just like you to know that I come from copying is not art and uh, weaning myself from the very get go on modern art. So let's look at this quote. There is no such thing as realism or abstraction necessarily. You'd find that out very quickly if you tried to eat a Cezanne apple, you'd get a mouthful of paint. So pretty much everything you make, no matter how skilled or how technical, it is your interpretation of something. You are not recreating something, you are interpreting what you see always. Mary Baker Eddy says, metaphysics resolves things into thoughts and exchanges the object of sense for the ideas of soul. 
And that's what we're doing. We're looking at things and we're having it pass through us and through our interpretation and through how we feel. And then, and then we're creating something with it afterwards. So we don't need to be concerned about getting things outwardly correct, which you hear so much about in, in art worlds. No, it's not the point. We need to focus on depicting what inwardly resonates. If it, you felt it if, it, if it expresses your mood or your, or your sorry, or, or your feelings or your outlook or your intention or your metaphor, or there's a bazillion other things, but having it mimic what it seems outwardly correct is not the point of art. Okay, everybody always wants to see your palette. So here's mine when it's clean. And let me tell you, it doesn't last that way very long, but I do get it this way periodically. So um, you'll notice there are a lot of saturated colors there. I have had people joke with me that they're surprised that there are as many neutrals as there are. Um, so I, yes, I love color, very clearly love color. One of the reasons that painting abstractly is fun is you get to use these colors. You don't have to only have fog colors in your palette. You can actually find ways and reasons to use that fuchsia. You don't know what else to do. Okay, so why do we paint? And what do we paint? Well, I think we paint because we want to connect to something beyond ourselves. That's why I paint. And that's why I know a lot of other people paint too. But what do we paint? We paint mostly nouns. And so we're gonna look at what, what are nouns. Nouns are person, places, things, or ideas. Now, most people only paint persons, places, or things. But what you're gonna hear in this talk is that ideas are also nouns that are things that we can paint. So let's look at a little roadmap for where this talk is going. I'm gonna inundate you with images. So I just thought you might wanna know how they're organized. First, we're gonna look at some paintings of people, places, and things um, in a range that between more impressionistic and more abstract. And then we're gonna look at some photography of objects to learn how to see more abstractly. And I think this is important because people act like abstraction isn't reality, but abstraction comes directly out of reality. And a lot of my, the photographs I'm gonna show you are gonna look extremely abstract, like they, you know, they aren't quote reality. Um, next, after that, we're going to look at paintings of ideas. And paintings of ideas is the thing that I specialize in and I truly love, and it's called abstract conceptualism. And it's a much wider discipline than is normally understood. So we're gonna, we're gonna really look at that because most people don't hear about it. Then we're gonna also look up at abstract expressionism and non-objective art, which most people think is all of abstract art, which is, it's actually um, just the hem of it. Okay. So we have realism, objects, and then when we bring ourselves to them, they tend toward impressionism. And it, the more impressionism in, is increased, they become abstract. And the more abstraction is increased, they become non-objective. So let's first look at some of my paintings of people, places, and things. And we'll start with more impressionistic realism at the beginning. And then uh, toward the end of this segment, they'll become more and more abstract. This is Lake Moraine, plein air painting. Where I have a quarry swimming hole, I swim in the summer and I just love the quality of light there. So the subject for me here is the quality of light more than the paint, more than the place. This is done on Long Lake in Maine. I was fascinated by the redness of the bark and the braid, braided branches. Fall leaves. This is on Islesford and uh, I, I was there to plein air paint the view across to Acadia and it was completely fogged in. And so I painted the apple trees instead. This is a uh, sand beach on Acadia and you can paint supposed reality and their abstract forms there. There's the very geometric forms in nature as well. 
just because the tree is gray doesn't mean we have to paint it gray. I include this painting because it's um, it was a formative experience for me. I was at a plein air painting at a plein air event for a very fancy um, member soiree at the Florence Griswold Museum. And this is a view from there. And it's a famous place where um, impressionists came and painted, you know, 150 years ago. And um, I had, was in very good company. The plein air painters that were there were just astonishingly excellent. And they, they were painting it exactly like it looked. And it was just amazing that they were, you know, had such technique and everything. But what was interesting to me is all the people in their tuxes with their, you know, glasses of champagne and the, the piano music in the background were all collected around me. And what I realized was, you know, for me, I bring myself to, to what I'm painting and they were trying to copy what they were seeing and doing a fabulous job of it. And what I realized, it wasn't just that it made me happier to bring me to um, up the painting. Other people actually prefer it as well. They don't need to, to see you on your you know, in your little ego, be able to reproduce what you're looking at. They can see what they're looking at and they don't, that doesn't give them any new information. It doesn't help them see in a new way. And um, after this painting, I stopped apologizing to people for painting it not the way it looked because I realized that I'm bringing something new to the equation and people need that. If they, that's one of the purposes of art. If we're just painting it the way it looks, then what more, do, what new do we have? And so here's some colors of early fall. One of the things you, you do to take in a, uh, something a little more abstractly is this was a huge fall scene, but I picked one little segment of it to express it instead of trying to do the whole thing. Uh, this is near my house. Dusk on the Bay of St. Lawrence. Here's me very happy on an October afternoon. This is my kind of weather and my kind of scenery and I just love it. Uh, I love it and maybe you can tell that I love it. What's interesting is it's pretty much the same time of year, very different feeling. This is a huge old friend that's in a graveyard and it was COVID and I had a very different feeling. So mood, get the mood, a little different. This one called Field of Dreams because I did it during a polar vortex ice storm and it was out of my imagination and it was cold and nasty and I needed to think spring was coming. So, I mean, another way to be more abstract, for example, is to paint out of your imagination and not paint from life or not paint from a photograph. People act like those are the two options. There's a third option. You can paint out of your imagination. These long sh shadows at Huntington Park pretty much look like that, but they're, they were very, there's a very abstract element to that. This is the path at Greenpoint. What a wonderful place. Purple trees and lush green everywhere. This is a favorite image of mine. Um, I pass by this, you know, twice a week and I know this spot very well. And when you know a spot very well, it's easy to simplify it. And sometimes when we take away all the details, not only does it become more abstract, but it also becomes more powerful. I painted the, this uh, peacock mostly because I was interested in, in the radial, uh, design element and the repeated pattern, um, but it also is a metaphor for all sorts of things. And um, those are the reasons I painted that. So we're getting into other things than landscapes here. Uh, one of the things that you can do to make something more abstract is to come in closer on it and not see the whole context, but just to see it close up. Here's another early COVID painting, the spring of 2020. Um, I did a lot of walking. It was cold and blue and blue in every kind of way that you think of being blue. It's like, when is this thing gonna be over? <laughs> um, and that 
mood is implied here in the what it seems to be like a landscape painting. Again, another COVID painting. Um, I was thinking about all those people that were alone in the city. Um, but this painting again is really more about the, the reverberating patterns and moving your eye around. For example, there's different points of red that bring your eye around and focus you in on the one person. So it, it's, it, it's about composition as much as anything else. This is kayaking to a sacred island. Um, I painted it from the kayak level and I added really kind of magical lighting to get across the idea of how magical it felt to be there. A very simple pastel painting, get, tending toward the abstract, showing how it felt to be in that thunderstorm. I went several days hiking recently in, in Vermont and I spent all my time hiking, so I didn't spend my time painting and I came home and I, this came pouring out of me, this painting happened very quickly as a kind of a sum total of my experience. So sometimes when you just steep yourself in something, then just go paint it from your head. And um, this painting came out very powerfully from a bunch of hiking experiences. This image house by the bay, it's, it is not made up like that one of me dreaming of spring in January. This one is a memory, a memory uh, from childhood. I had a, paint, a, a subscription to Arthur, Architectural Digest and I had a picture out of there on my bulletin board next to my bed on all of my teen years. And it was this very um, architectural angled house uh, looking out at the bay and it was just interesting because I still remember it, but because it was so long since I'd seen the image, um, I couldn't get the specifics correct, but I could get the feeling correct. And I don't know if you can see the bay, but the, the bay's out on the left side in the middle. Um, so painting from memory is another way to be more abstract because you don't have the details. This is a close in mood thing of, of water with stars reflected in it. Getting more abstract. Without the title, you might still know what it was. You could consider it a landscape or you could consider it an abstract. Going a little more abstract here is the Aurora Borealis, still a landscape. Very bright. And this is also a landscape. I did this recently last spring. I was absolutely out of my mind, thrilled to see the spring. And I went, this is well done plein air. I went thinking I was gonna paint something more realistic. There's a pond here with polywogs in it and everything. But I was just so excited that this is what happened. And you get my feeling and you get the thrill of being there. And um, I've captured that feeling and I feel it again every time I see it. So much better than trying to just restate what I was looking at. So we said per people, places, or things. So here we go, here's Edith. And I think even Edith would say it looks like her. Here's another one. Call this jugular, more abstracted. Then you can abstract even further. You can imagine what something looks like inside the body. So here's sinew. And I also did another one inside the body in utero. My niece was having a baby and I was thinking and praying for her child and painted this. So you can look, think about things from different perspectives. This is frog eggs as seen from the bottom of the pond. So you're looking up from the floor of the pond at the frog legs, frog eggs, and then the lily pad undersides of the lily pads above. To completely abstracted image, it, but it actually is something. This is another COVID painting. Here I am at home, and I'm resorting to painting, you know, kitchen utensils. So here you go. But even kitchen utensils can be done creatively, and I felt like this was really more about preparation than it was about the utensils. 
I love this one. It's it's really um, it's a strata divided into thirds, uh, um, but it's about raising the shade on the morning. It's about that moment of enlightenment where it goes from from dark to light. But it also could be considered a thing. There's a shade and there's a landscape. This was painted in plein air. Uh, my daughter climbed Mount Katahdin last August, and I sat at the foot of Katahdin, not worrying about her doing that by herself. And I did this painting at that time. So it is actually not that abstracted because as you will see in some of the other photos, um, some of these things can look pretty darn abstract on their own. What's different about it is, is it's magnified. It's a lot big, it's painted a lot bigger than it is um, in life. I don't know if you've ever seen Japanese lanterns, but this is looking up at Japanese lanterns as they're taking off in flight from looking at them from beneath. So it's again, it's a, it's a different perspective can lead to abstraction. And I did this actually in that workshop that uh, Mary Beth mentioned. Here's a, a, another way to be abstract is to do things in different colorways. And I, included this um, it, up through the meadow. This is your, because sometimes we're deep in the weeds, right? And we need to look up and out and further and, and move out, up, up the hill and into the, into the open. And it could have been cataloged here in this, in this thing under paintings that have meaning to me in terms of what I'm trying to express. But I'll put it here because I really wanna get across that you don't need much to realize something's a landscape. I mean, most people would say a horizontal, but this and also the Roar Borealis, you knew they were landscapes. They, you didn't even have a horizontal, um, but this is a landscape. You're like a bug down in the weeds. Okay, so that's showing you person, places and things. Um, and of course they were not, none of them were done literally. They were all done at least impressionistically or maybe a little more abstractly. So now I want to help you learn to see a little more abstractly. And we're gonna look at the next series of images, which are photographs. Um, and then just give you an idea of how to start looking at the world. Um, and this is certainly the way I look at the world, which is why I see abstraction everywhere. And you'll start to see that you can too. Um, you can use this kind of photography as inspirations for thinking about abstraction or even as uh, source material when you um, start into painting for some abstraction. So I really encourage you to look for and take these kind of reference photos whenever you see it and it's like a little treasure hunt. It's totally fun and I give you some some ideas of how to do that in that second handout I gave you. So I already said this, basically we wanna use these as jumping off places. We don't want to take abstract photos and then faithfully copy them, reproduce them into a painting. That is not the way we wanna paint abstractly in my opinion. We want to filter them all again through ourselves and, and see how they come out. So abstraction is about composition more than any other one thing. So the first thing we wanna do is we wanna look for composition everywhere. And abstraction is also about expressing a part of the whole. So when we saw that big magnolia, for example, or that little, that bark of, of, of moss and lichen, we we're just looking at part of the whole. You didn't get the whole forest or the whole magnolia tree. Light, shadow, reflection, feeling, perspective, proportion, scale, density, depth, pattern, shape, line, color, contrast, value, texture, design principles, the way your eye moves around, all this is the subject matter itself. And if you can take my workshop in next September, we really get into how all these things come into play in abstract art. So abstraction looks closer at reality. I really wanna really highlight that for you all. It looks closer at reality. It's not looking away from reality. It's not denying reality. It's actually looking closer at reality. Okay, it doesn't obscure or deviate from reality. It brings out overlooked aspects of reality that are all there if you just train your eyes to see them. So we're gonna go through a bunch of 
my photographs here and I've divided them up into categories and, and you can start to see how an abstract artist sees the world. Okay, we're gonna first look for naturally occurring compositions everywhere. I took this photograph at a college kiosk. It looks like a collage, doesn't it? But it's actually just a photograph. Took this at the newspaper, it's piles of newspapers. This is leaves floating on a pond. A root, very interesting composition. Some radial lines for composition. There's a focal point there, isn't there? Some composition going on. This may not be a very interesting photograph, but let me tell you if you use this as a, as a reference photo for an abstract piece of art, it'd be amazing because all the composition is actually there. This is peeling paint from an underpass I took recently. This was from a garden shop I was in and I thought, wow, there was an artist that put that together, right? It's, there's composition right there. This is coming down the stairs in a museum. Another composition from the woods. But again, you come in closer and you crop something and all of a sudden you have composition going on. It's amazing composition and, and you know, no artist actually made it, but it was there. But we can look at that and in a photograph, we can analyze why it works. And the more we analyze why that works, we'll know if and when our abstract art works as well. This is me coming out and my car was dusted with snow. This is at the beach. I loved all those little ripples. But again, composition. If you take those shapes and you did something else with them in completely different colors, you'd have a piece of art. I do use other mediums. This is me washing off my palette and I'm like, oh, why? And I take a picture of my own palette. There you go. Here's my husband's boot print on the front porch and I stop and I take a picture of that too. Love the colors there. Composition everywhere. Everyone else is cold at Costco, but no, me, I'm looking at the blue light and I'm looking at the snow in the carriages and I'm looking, oh, don't those look like pillows? And I'm thinking, wow, this is a composition. And everyone else is like freezing and can't wait to get in the place. And here's me in the grocery store parking lot at about midnight taking pictures of how the carts rolled through the snow. Okay, peeling paint is also great fodder for abstraction and you can look for other textures too like fiber and cacti. Looks like abstract art. Took this one in Maine. More Maine. Look at all that fabulous texture. You can look for unexpected colors in nature. Now, none of, none of the pictures I have anywhere in this slideshow have been photoshopped or doctored up in any way. I take it the way it looks, so here we go. Yes, it looked that way. If I focused on the water, I would get the sky too light. And if I focus on the sky, get the water too light, but it was all that color in life. Look at the sun on these rocks. It'd be very hard to paint this and have it look non-abstract because it, most people just don't have an experience of sun hitting rocks like that. This was like a seven layer rainbow there's something very abstract about it with the, the power lines and the mountain behind the train in front. How's that for an abstract shape? Okay, we can look at um, one thing in a multitude of compositions. So sometimes it's helpful when you're doing a, a photo study to, to take the palm tree or the 
the certain kind of plant and just take it from a lot of different angles and really work it and see see what's what's most interesting. So I did this with a few plants just to show you how I would think about it. This is a very abstract composition, but here's the same thing, different abstract composition, different abstract composition. So keep keep looking at something and don't just take the one view you get of it. Here's another one, another example. Let's look at it here. Oh, but if we look closer, look, that's interesting. Oh, let's look at it even closer. See, now if we took that composition and did that in different colors, we'd have a very different thing. Or let's look at really down low and look at it like that. Okay, let's also consider grid patterns, for example. Here I am opening my drawer for some thread and I go, ah, and run for my phone because guess what? I just saw a composition. Didn't touch anything, didn't arrange anything. This is the way it was. It's a grid pattern. Here's another thread grid pattern. And maybe another thread grid pattern. But there are grid patterns everywhere. Just go in the grocery store. There's art everywhere. We look at art everywhere. Somebody intentionally did that beautiful work. Oh, and this beautiful work too. Look at how they're placed. I didn't change them around. That's just the way they came. Isn't this lovely? That's in an Amish dry goods store. This is my daughter's bookshelf grid pattern. Oh, and guess what? Most of our pastel boxes are pretty good grid pattern too. And me coming home from the farmer's market. Oh, grid pattern. So silly me, I can't get very far in the door with my strawberries before I decide I have to take a picture because it's a abstract art. I was in a hotel looking out across at this um, car park in Chicago and I saw the grid pattern and I saw, I saw the, the placement of all those different red cars. Look at the, you know, it's a, it's a composition. It is a total fodder for an abstract painting. And then right after that, I saw this in a gas station. I thought, oh, wow, blew my mind, the, the two next to each other. Look at life as an abstract art, artist and it'll never be dull. Okay, we can find abstraction in all sorts of organic shapes in nature. And I'm sure that's gonna be an easy accessible thing for most of you people watching this. Organic shapes are always beautiful. But look for them where you, you, know, you don't necessarily think about them. I'm a big fan of bark, love it. I took this picture with you, the people in Maine just last June. What about mushrooms and their shapes? These look like little shells or flowers close in. Oh, they're beautiful ruffles. You could totally use this as a jumping off place for an amazing piece of abstract art. This too, look at the fan shape there. Almost looks like a delta from the air. Nature is amazing. Abstraction is everywhere. Look at those little fireworks going off. I parked my car in front of this tree and it blew my mind. Doesn't that look like I mean, this is literally just a photograph, but if you painted that, especially if you added some interesting color to it or something, it'd be an abstract art, pre, art painting very quickly. Here's another beautiful tender jumping off place for an abstract painting. Gotta love seaweed. Very interesting compositions in seaweed. Shapes, you're gonna look for shapes and relationships in abstract art. So when you take your photos, that's what you're looking for, shapes and relationships. Contrast, the big contrast between the sturdy bark and the tender leaves. This is a 
close up of birch bark in Maine. Love the contrasting colors. Compliments. Interesting shapes are everywhere. Look at that fascinating little tulip there. So all of these kind of shapes and and um, relationships with fabulous jumping off places for abstract art. What if you did this in all different colors? Holly? Yes, dear. Donna wants to know what camera do you use for your photos? Is it a cell phone? A yeah, it's a phone? cell phone. What it's kind? It's a cell phone. I have an uh, iPhone 10. I'm just snapping them. I, I had a good camera, but you don't always have that with you. And the beauty is that, uh, that my old version of this, this slideshow, I had a lot of really proper photos taken, you know, with a real camera. But the beauty of, of a cell phone is that everyone has one and everyone's got it with them all the time. And so when you see the snow in your car, you've got it in your pocket and you can pull it out. Organic shapes, but again, here's composition. Could do a lot with yeah. that. It's not as complicated as that. So if you're new to abstract art, maybe you start with the blueberries. And somebody that's done it for a while might wanna work on that. Okay, let's also talk about unique perspectives. It's another way to get, go more abstract. Here's me in that same hotel in Chicago. I'm looking down from my hotel window to the people eating <laughs> below. Nice. I'm in the art museum looking down on uh, orchestra playing. I'm uh, on Mount Cadillac, I think, in looking down. And then uh, here I'm leaning way over and looking up. This is a block from my house, and I liked how the reflection was in the puddle, but I had to get really low. So, you know, compositionally to really change it up will automatically make something feel more abstract. Okay, rocks are another favorite um, jumping off place for abstraction material. You'll see this later I used as a reference photo for an idea that I wanted to do. This is at Skudik in Maine. So everything is a composition. I, I see these things and I see the colored juxtapositions and I see the big shapes and the small shapes. Okay, we can do the same thing with shapes and components of architectural things. Look at the reflection there, very interesting. Strong composition. So it can be complicated or it can be simple. Both are strong in different ways. So, you know, I've done so many paintings and I have a bazillion more left in me. It's because I see composition and such variety all the time and I'm, and I have a, a camera going all the time. So there, there's so many ways to see things. This is at the Met, amazing photograph, but again, fascinating composition. Okay, reflections offer all sorts of opportunities for abstraction and maybe one of the more obvious ways. This is, I took it at Acadia, in Bubble Pond, I think. I walked out of a restaurant. This is, this is my car. I'm like, ah, yeah. look at that. <laughs> This is me kayaking on Labor Day in Maine. I love the reflections here with the, the, in the plexiglass of the fire in the restaurant. 
I, this is a place I walk almost daily here. Look at the reflection here. That's just a floor. This is in Yosemite. It was very, very dry when I was there. And then it rained that night and I was in a tent next to this river and I went out and this is about one inch of water, but it was totally still and reflecting just like that. It was amazing. It looks very abstract with those rocks looking you know, round like that, but it's just a reflection. And here's a really abstract reflection in a, in a indoor pool. This was recently up in Baxter State Park. Again, very simple to, you could do a paper, paper cutout of two different shapes. It's extremely abstract. Holly? Yes, dear. Joyce would like to know, um, can you talk about how you organize your photos? It gets overwhelming, she says. Um, how I overwhelm my photos in, in my computer, you mean? Um, I, I do it by year and I do it by topic. So um, I can actually put my hands on anything pretty quickly. Um, if I go on a trip, I have a separate file for the trip. So for example, this trip to Baxter State Park has a, has a trip file and then I have my art in a different file. So I, I keep them in files. Here's another reflection photo. There's multiple layers of reflection going on here. And it also, we could reflect on the fact he just got a ticket too. Okay, so water is probably the easiest uh, to see as abstract. These are actually photographs unchanged. This is um, in a marina and the, the reflections of the boats. It's on my walk. This is in Maine on Long Lake. This leaves under the water and the branches being reflected in the water from above. So it, that looks like somebody was just doing willy nilly on a, on a paper, but this is actually quote reality and people act like abstraction isn't real. Look at that. Donna would like to know, do you store your phone pictures in the cloud? She says, my phone I, is a I gazillion have, I have, photos. <laughs> I, have, I have probably four photos right now on my phone. I download them almost daily into a backup drive. And then I categorize them in the backup drive. So I do not keep them on my phone, no. I actually, to, to respond to that a little more, um, I have a very active Insta Instagram account Polyca at Polycaster. And so if there's something, I, that you keep on your phone because you want to show people. I tend to put that on Instagram. So if I want to show people, I pull up Instagram to show them instead of have it all on my phone. Does that make sense? Here's another reflection or water photo. Another water photo. So the light bouncing off water. The, the water is going to completely take on A, the light, and B, whatever it's reflecting. I love the purples in that one. Isn't that fun? And here's the bubbles that are reflecting coming off of a fountain. Took this one very recently. And th this was. Uh, the saturation wasn't taken out of it or anything. It was just really that gray of a day. And I had, I had winter trees and, and gray skies and, I, and that picture was taken. And this was taken up on um, Cranberry Island in Maine. So snow and ice also lend themselves to abstraction. So before you slip on it, take a picture of it. <laughs> Holly, when you say you put them on an external drive, you mean like an external hard drive? External hard drive, yes. Mm -hmm. How many gig on that or terabytes? I have two, three terabytes. So this is ice that started to melt. 
This is ice in a puddle. Here's just snow on rocks, but I love the composition. I would never think of putting that little shape at the top, but when you see it in your, your camera, you're like, oh, that works. Okay, shadows, another whole category for seeing what how they work in a composition. This is my uh, bathroom floor. <laughs> I'm going in my bathroom. I was like, oh, wait a minute. <laughs> Literally, this is the, my, the, the pole for my sink and those are the, the, from the blind coming in. There's my bathroom floor tile. Look at the shapes of the chairs. Those are fascinating, little bean shapes. I love the blue colors of some of these shadows. This is just on the floor in my house. This is across the street. Without the shadow, it wouldn't be much of a composition, but with the shadow, wow. Same with that. Shadows can be very abstract. I particularly like this one. Fascinating how the shadow is so bent like that, huh? You couldn't paint that and have people not think it was abstract. They would think it wasn't like that in real life, but actually it was. Okay, so we talked already a little bit about cropping closer, but here's some man-made things that I crop closer on. Composition with the orange driving driver's wheel, part of a boat, house that's being built, dock floating on Long Lake in Maine. It looks like it's literally suspended in air, but that is so still. That's a reflection. You know, here's here's me getting low again and getting a, a an angle on something. To, to make it more interesting, the diagonals make a, a composition much more alive. And then you have the overlay of the light onto the other shapes and colors. Lots going on in that picture that makes it very abstract. Okay, those that follow my blog know I like to eat. <laughs> here, uh, here, food is also abstract shapes, lots to love. Inspiration is everywhere. I can't even eat my grapefruit without having to take a picture of it. Here's me at the farmer's market. Here's me just chopping up stuff for dinner and I see an abstract composition. And sunrises and sunsets offer gradient ideas and work well as compositional inspiration. I, this picture has actually like that. Amazing, huh? That's in Maine too. Okay, and la this is the last thing we're going to look at at photographs, and then we're going to get on to paintings. But look for distortion. Holly? Yes, Sorry. dear. Joyce asks, while you're working on a painting, do you keep your reference photo in front of you, or do you jump off fairly quickly? Um, I hardly ever use a reference photo. All of this is for me, is passing through me. It's passing through me. There's like one painting I can show that I did refer to a reference photo a little bit and I'll show you which one that is. I, the, the point of doing this is to give yourself a mental vocabulary of what's interesting and what, what provides um, contrast. And, you know, it's, it's a study. And once you've done the study, you don't have to have, you know, if you really studied well, you don't need the open book for the open book test because you already did the study basically. So let's look at these distortions. This um, 
this is my brother-in-law's books through a glass block. He has one of those bookcases made with glass blocks and then boards and then glass blocks and boards. So I'm looking through the glass block at his book books in the bookcase. And then the next one, I moved a millimeter and that's what it looked like, okay? Yeah. Automatic abstract art. Yeah. Things are, abstract art is everywhere. And that's one of the things I want you to really leave this with, leave this talk with, to start looking at and finding it and realizing that it's real and it's not stepping outside of reality, but actually looking more closely at it. Barbara okay. Snap says that I'm finding if I squint at your photographs, the striking parts stand out and the other parts blur. I think I may try that for my painting. That's a great idea. Yeah. Good. So abstraction is mindfully paying attention to reality in shape, form, texture, composition, interaction, and juxtaposition. Abstraction plunges deeper. Some people think abstraction obscures reality or departs from it, but I'm here to tell you that it's exactly the opposite. It focuses on aspects of reality that a lot of people don't notice or think about and explores them further. Okay, so we looked at a variety of paintings and photographs of persons, places, and things. Now we are going to talk about painting ideas directly. And this is where I think it starts to get fun. Can you see how painting anger would look very different than painting peace? What about painting flexibility or strength or obedience or purpose? They already start out as abstract and then we just have to find a way to depict them. The fun thing about this is everyone would do it differently every time. Painting ideas directly is called abstract conceptualism. Abstract conceptualism starts with a non-material idea and then very intentionally objectifies it. So let's look at some various approaches of this. I've separated them out into different categories. So you can, um, on your little handout that you've got, you can run with maybe something of one of these categories later on your own. Sometimes artists paints things or places to explore ideas behind them. And so I got some examples of that here and I didn't put them in with the person, places or things because really the reason I painted them was more about what they made me consider abstractly. So let's look at some of those. Here's growing and rocky ground. Um, I painted this because I know people that have had difficult upbringings and have had obstacles at every turn. And this painting is, is about showing them that you can grow into a lovely tree regardless of how rocky your ground was. So it's really not a, a landscape painting. It's actually abstract conceptualism because there was a concept that I was thinking about and trying to get across. Here is old growth and old growth I painted, I'd like to, wanted to get across a sense of constancy of this, these uh, redwoods, their enduring presence um, as a uh, symbol of sustainability. I liked how that the older they are, the more stately and inspiring they are. Um, I think that we all can relate to that. The older we are, the more stately and inspiring we are, right? Yeah. <laughs> yes. <laughs> the more they reach for the light, the more nourished they are. I love that as a metaphor. And the better they grow, the more they reach for the light. So we should take their cue and we should reach for the light. And just by being themselves, they breathe out into the world exactly what the world needs. And I think that is just colossal. Just by being who you are, you give the world what you need. Just by being what they are, a tree, they give oxygen to the world. And so I felt like they're an example of health for us all and the way to um, grow old gracefully. So that's why this is an abstract conceptualist piece and not a landscape. From Storm into sun Sunshine was, was painted in Yellowstone and we came up the uh, Bear Pass and it's a very um, steep drive and it doesn't have uh, guardrails on the side. And I was with my daughter and there we were in this torrential storm and we couldn't see, you know, 
10 feet ahead of us and I was driving this thing and I wasn't sure where the road was and it was a little white knuckling. And we came up over the path into the sunshine and there was this scene and I painted it because to me it was a metaphor of that feeling you go from this white knuckle nail biting situation into getting past it and the sun comes out. So it's a metaphor for all the getting through a problem and getting into the light and getting uh, having the storm be over. This one was a little similar, but not as dramatic. Um, we had weeks and weeks, like seven weeks of rain. And this is a view out my, my uh, studio window. And it really is about the thrill of actually having some sun hit that tree out my window because it had been raining for so long. And it, again, it looks like a landscape, but to me, it is a conceptual piece because it's really about the hot diggity dog dance of that moment that we finally had sun when we hadn't had it for a long time. This is called Life After Death, and that's the reason I painted it, because I was seeing it as a metaphor of life after death. Here we have a milkweed pod, and it's dying. It's all dried and crumbled and going down, but it's in, simultaneously it's letting seeds off that are, that are the continuation of life. So there's this life cycle. The whole life cycle is happening in, in the immediate moment that there's, there, it seems to be passing along, but it seems to be starting all at the same time. And that's what this piece is trying to express. And it looks like it might be a thing, but actually it's an abstract conceptualist piece. So let's also look at painting the essence of words. I love to pick a word and then paint it. So here is my classic, um, Example, I have this one on my artist business card because it's my classic example, but I chose the word confidence. And what does confidence look like? And you have to think about what confidence looks like. And it's kind of assertive and it comes at you. And, and um, anyway, this is my depiction of confidence. I did the same thing for meandering curiosities. Now, it's interesting because there really is not a focal point in this because the whole idea of curiosity is that you, you, you keep getting curious, so you get, keep moving. So it's really about moving your eye through the piece. So I try to paint curiosity. This is voltage. I actually have that next to my bed in my bedroom. Zazing, boom. This is psyche. I had, I had this in a show once and somebody walked up, didn't know the title and she says, wow, that looks like a person thinking. And I was like, yes, bingo, I did it. Yes. <laughs> so here is aggregate. This is the one I said that I, I had, I actually used that photo reference that I had up there in the, among the rocks. So this, these are little main rocks um, nestled between a couple big main rocks, but I was actually doing an abstract conceptualist piece, I liked the word aggregate because it had so many very different meanings. And I wanted to show aggregate, a uh, painting of aggregate with all those different meanings together. So aggregate is a, a gathering or a collection, a whole that's formed from disparate parts. It's also unity among those separate units to form an overall um, composite. And I really like how this painting describes all the different phases of the word, the, both the noun and the adjective and the verb. So um, one of my favorite ways to do abstract conceptualism is just to pick a word and then start playing with how you're gonna depict it. Um, there's a lot of thinking process involved in that. Um, it's not just zoom in and see what happens. You really have to think about what you're doing. Here I am during the pandemic and there are not enough respirators for everybody. So I painted respiration. I was thinking about what respiration was like and how bre what breathing felt like. And this is the painting as the result. Uh, for those of you that were on the, the main plein air retreat, I did a painting I didn't like too well at that second place that we went and um, I painted over it. And so I decided the obfuscation was a good word to, to, to do when I painted over that other painting. So you can't see that other painting under there, but 
this is what I painted over it and it's called obfuscation and I like it much better than what was in here. Here's the word nexus, a word that I like and I'm thinking about what, what to, um, how to depict nexus. I thought of what the cruciform uh, originally meant before it had overlays of um, religious connotations. It, uh, cruciform used to mean that you had kind of this heavenly element is the vertical going up into the heavens and the earthly element was a horizontal going across and um, and the, the nexus was where those two things come together. So that's what I tried to depict in order to depict nexus. So let's paint ideas directly here. Epiphany. Now you can consider it a word, but it's really more of an idea. It's a state of being, a state of thinking. So here's epiphany, a kind of eureka. Oh my gosh, I finally understand it moment. Here's empathy, warm and comfortable and understanding. I wanted to paint July. That's a non-material idea, right? So how do you paint July? What's interesting is I, my husband from West Texas looked at this and that wasn't July to him. But it was July to me. It had fireflies and starry skies and ice cubes and marshmallows and floating around in the water and um, just really relaxing. And um, anyway, so everyone, there's room for everyone in abstract conceptualism because we all have a different take on things and it's a fascinating way to see each other's take on things. Holly? Yes, dear. Elisa wants to know, have you used oils or other types of paint? And what is it about pastel medium that specifically enhances your ideas? I actually do paint in oils and um, acrylics and collage. Um, I, I do a lot of mixed media, all sorts of things. So I like pastel probably because it harkens me back to my earliest roots, honestly. Um, for example, this is a good slide to have up to answer that question. To paint this painting in acrylic, for example, would be very easy because you'd paint each, each one of those rings, you paint the layer and then you'd paint, you know, then you could do those ice cube marshmallow things on top of them. To do it in pastel was a lot harder. I had to have a plan. I had to know what I was gonna do. And so I feel this very much as a pastelist. And I do, most of my conceptualist work is done in pastel because I, I'm putting thinking into it. I'm putting a lot of thinking into it. But later on, when we talk about abstract expressionism and abstract um, and non-objective work, um, most of that kind of work of mine is done in different media. And you'll see that I have fewer examples of those. This is Ohm, and originally I was thinking of having that stripe go horizontally, but then I realized they were really connecting with what's above and greater than us, so I turned it on its head. Here's Steaming Hot. How would you paint Steaming Hot? That day, this is how I painted Steaming Hot. So I have a whole list of hundreds and hundreds and hundreds of words, and when I think of some word I want to add to my list, and sometimes when I don't know what to do, I go to my list like, okay, well, let's do steamy hot today. And I did steamy hot. But, you know, collecting words just like you collect those photo references is also a very good way to get the ideas marinating. This is called conundrum. And I don't know if you can tell, but if from the bottom, you're coming along the path and then you have to choose between going to the right or going to the left. And oh my gosh, what am I gonna do? It was right in the middle. And that's what this painting is about. This is dark matter. I have a daughter getting a PhD in physics. So we were talking about dark matter and um, here's my depiction of it. Here's seven truths. I was thinking about seven different synonyms for God actually. And I was thinking how they all overlap with each other. And this painting was the result. A lot of people talk about how I have so many hard edges in my paintings. So I happen to like hard edges. I'm a big fan of hard edges. So I'm much more inclined to have mostly hard edges and a few soft. And I, I seem to be uh, in the minority in that camp. Most people have mostly soft edges and a few hard. So I painted mild mannered just to show that I can do soft edges. I just don't really like them very much. 
Here's happy camping. It depicts the mood. It depicts an idea of being there. It depicts the freedom and beauty and solitude of that experience. Here's breaking through. The, the, the corners represent like a glass-like thing and we've broken through to see what's beyond in, in the middle part of the. Here's childhood imagination. And if you had to depict childhood imagination, you might do it differently than I did it, but here it is. And what I really wanted to get to here in childhood imagination is that um, a lot of it, it that it's not a non-material thing. I mean, you're not the kids are when they're in their imagination, they're not in in everything that we can see. So it's a very abstract thing right away. And it's more like an inner landscape than an outer landscape. So I I drew, drew uh, an inner landscape in an outer landscape. And one of the things that I also love about this childhood imagination is that it's universal. Kids everywhere play in their imagination in a very similar way. And it's not um, determined by culture or, or faith background or anything else. They, they really can work with the unseen. And somehow when we get older, working with the unseen seems uncomfortable. Like how do you paint a non-material idea? Well, it's unseen, but as a child that had an imagination, we played with the unseen all the time. And so just to, to um, tap into that was really what we were thinking about here. Here's layers of memory. I, um, I had a dad who died of Alzheimer's. <clears throat> so memory is something that I've thought a lot about. And this as a many, many, many multi-layer pastel painting that was actually quite difficult to do. If you look deep, 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 far back, there's a lot of things and then they come more and more and more forward. Um, so, and that's really how I think memory is. And it's fascinating to me what, what the deeper layers give to the more forefront things and why are the more forefront things, the more forefront things. Um, Anyway, I did a lot of con contemplating memory while I painted this. Okay, now abstract conceptualism is usually known as social commentary. For example, if you go into a museum, modern museum to see abstract conceptualism, you'll see a pile of newspapers in the middle of the room and that will, will be the thing because they're making some commentary on, you know, all the paper we use or all the transientness of news or whatever they're trying to say. Well, I do do some um, social commentary as well, but it's not my main gig, but every once in a while I feel compelled. Here was fake news. Here's overcoming white supremacy. I, I felt like it's ridiculous to think that white is supreme as an artist. We use the whole range of colors. So there's actually not a white used in this. There's everything has color and the contrast is important and the, the diversity is important or we wouldn't have our compositions. So overcoming white supremacy as an artist seems pretty obvious. This is kind of a, a, a slap on everybody looking at themselves in the mirror all the time. Um, a mirror, mirror on the wall is from, from you know the fairy tales, who's the fairest of them all? Well, I don't feel like the mirror tells you who I am at all. I, I don't feel like what I look like in the mirror and, and back to the childhood imagination and, and really identifying yourselves with, with the unseen. I, I'm, I'm a bunch of qualities and attributes I've made up of all sorts of ideas. I am not what you see in the mirror. So to me, this is a commentary painting. This uh, painting got an honorable mention in your show last spring. It's celebrating our differences. It was painted during the 2020 um, election season when there was so much contention. And the real commentary is that um, you have to have contrasts of, of opposites um, to make a painting work. You, and, and that the, the contrasts are complementary and and work together to make a beautiful composition. It's not a negative thing. It can be 
um, embraced in a way that it becomes uh, the harmonizing element. And that's what I was trying to say in this painting. I've just started a new series. Uh, this is the first one. It's Global Warming 2021. I plan on doing a global warming painting each year. And at some point, I, you know, 20 years from now, I'd like to have a, a global warming show with my 20 paintings, one from each year. And my hope is that I doesn't go from bad to worse and, and be more and more desperate, that maybe things look up. So we will see. Um, but this is the first depiction of how I feel about global warming at the moment. This one's called spiritual warfare, which sounds ominous, but basically I'm thinking about the, the um, conflict between good and error, or, um, the truth and, and lies or, you know, however, whatever dichotomy you wanna put forward. Um, and that, that there'll be a resolution and there'll be a victor on the side of right. This, Painting is, um, I say it's social commentary. It's really more a commentary on myself when the Black Lives Matter movement happened. I, um, I realized that I use all those colors in my paintings, but I very rarely use black and brown. And I felt a little convicted about this, that, that um, the black and brown mattered as well. And so I, um, I painted this painting with only the blacks and the browns. And it was interesting in my, recent one 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 show that Mary Beth rep, um, mentioned, I had 77 paintings and this one painting was a real focal point because the whole room was filled with color and your eye right went, went right to this painting that was black and brown. Mm. This is a social commentary painting. It looks like a landscape, but it's called My Childhood in Nature. And basically I told you already that I grew up in the national parks all over the country. This is my childhood. and. The reason that it, and I, that's me scampering off into the sunlight, you know, and so um, there's a reason that I think so much and I, and I um, embrace the world so deeply because I have this background and I worry about the kids that are only on screens and are only indoors and have never been outside and don't know this. And so I painted my childhood to highlight how was your childhood doing? Here's a, a different painting. I don't do too many portraits, but um, uh, the artist Fetchin has a Native American that he painted. And this is done in the exact same style as his, except for the fact that I made it young and female. And his was a, an older uh, male elder. And I painted this at the time where the young women Native Americans were coming into Congress and I was just really inspired by the fact that they were finally getting some representation and that it was young and female. Here's a, a painting called Orbs of Hope. I had been reading a book about the population explosion and the very different um, ideas of how to solve that, which were both not very encouraging. And so this is my middle of the road approach that I pe picked beatnik colors on purpose to kind of have the 60s love fest feeling to it. Um, and I believe that there's a solution between um, these polarized disparate views of how to handle things. Okay, we can also choose to paint relationships if we wanna do conceptual work. Um, here's my painting between mother and child shows the relationship and shows the feeling without the objects. And here are some objects. This is a pandemic painting. Don't you know, I walked into my kitchen. I was like, whoa, I saw all the color relationships there. It was like a, this perfect composition. The yellows talking to the yellows and the blues talking to the blues and the metals, metal ones talking to the metal ones and the orange going bing, 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 all four of them talking to each other. And it was a composition and in that, sense that it was a complete composition just in those relationships. It's really about the relationships there. This is a new painting of mine that's um, seen a lot of shows this year. We just recently came back from a National Women's Show. Um, it's called Insinuations, but really what it is, is I, I spent a lot of time looking at water during the pandemic and taking pictures of water. And 
I saw a lot of female shapes in the water. And um, those female shapes were insinuations in the water. But I, when I started thinking more about it, both water and women are kind of ubiquitous and un, uh, unacknowledged as, as important as, as they are. And to me, this painting was about um, both water and women and how they are all important and shouldn't be noticed basically. So we can look at painting as a process. I did this for a, a homeless shelter, not a homeless, a domestic violence shelter. And the, the violence part is the part that's in the foreground and the hope is in the background. And it's called From Violence to Hope. This is called Searching for Truth. There are the searchlights are looking for truth. And then I have superimposed and there are a bunch of different um, symbols from a bunch of different religious um, persuasions. It's a very big painting. This is called Breathe In. Wow. Yeah, it was in my most recent show. Uh, follow all the clues. And there's a few red herrings, but we got to follow all the clues and we got to go through the process of seeing where they lead. Hybridization is a, a process and I'm painting that here. I, I lost a friend of mine um, and uh, I painted her at the portal of the afterlife. And I kind of liked that it looked like she was standing in front of an abstract painting in a museum, but she's really looking out at her future, which is the afterlife. So again, I'm communicating an idea, but it looks, there's, uh, there's some symbols there. Wow. This is putting the pieces together. None of them are together yet, but maybe they'll resolve. Okay, we can also paint poetry or the essence of a story or culture. So here's me painting a Sufi poem called the Rubia. Mm -hmm. Here's me painting Daniel in the lion's den. Mm -hmm. And uh, I have him praying and I have the, have the light from above look like his, um, his communication with God. But really the, the abstract part of it is him, his hair and his beard looking like a mane. So he's, he's blending in, you know, feel, trying to feel at one with the lions there. So, you know, so he doesn't look like lion food. And um, it's, it, you know, you bring your own sense of interpretation to a story. Here's Jonah and the whale. Very abstract, gets the whole story across. Uh, my cup runneth over is a line out of the 23rd Psalm. And it's a, a, a concept I thought was, was fun to consider how to paint. Wow. I, considered, I considered putting my cup runneth over on the, on the thing for this uh, wine and watch because the cup running over over there. Mm. <laughs> uh, we can paint music or sound. I have a whole sound series. I just picked a few more of the most recent ones. Here's bird song at daybreak. Because a wow. non-material thing is sound is a very non-material thing. So we can paint it. And in last spring, the birds were going nuts. And so I depicted it. Euphonium sound. I played baritone in the marching band. And I love the oompa oompa low sound coming out of the baritone. And this is a very detailed painting that you can't quite pick out in this. The, the, the little nuggets of sound all have texture and detail to them. That's pretty phenomenal in this painting. This is Italian opera with the diva in the middle. And chords. Here's the woodland whistle. So how would you depict a sound? There's endless ways. I'm still finding them. Okay, we can paint light itself. Here's walking into the light. 
yes, I could have painted it more photorealistically, but it wouldn't have gotten across my idea. Hmm. Here's from the tree house. It's about the light. The light is the subject, literally. This is sunspots. A lot of people think it means sunspots on the sun. No, I mean it as a photographer. I get those sunspots in my in my photos sometimes. And that's, I was painting a picture of literally those sunspots that get in your photos. And I painted this, this is spring is coming. I was really, spring wasn't here yet. It was just coming, but there's this quality of the light that you feel, oh my gosh, spring is coming even before it's come. And that's what this painting is about. I'm trying to capture a quality of light. So we can paint motion and verbs. Here's a catkin bursting. If you know what a catkin is, it's a little bud right in the, right in the spring. It, then it bursts open very quickly and a lot of energy behind it. This is carpe diem, which means seize the day. So if you were gonna paint seize the day, how would you do it? Basically, I chose a very strong color set with a, a very grabbing focal point to seize the day. And this is windblown. I have a, a weeping cherry tree out my front window and um, often look at the wind blowing those branches. So I encourage you to try to paint abstract conceptualism if you haven't already. Challenge yourself to paint a non-material idea. I have some ideas on the handouts, but you know you can start thinking of some ideas. Um, and you know, just when you're in the shower, you're driving along. You know, think about some non-material ideas. I mean, there's some big ones like love or whatever, but it helps to get a really more specific one, which is why I get down to something like aggregate or or propulsion or really the voltage or really specified things because it's more easy to think about how you would depict it, depict it. So representational art and impressionism are actually abstract because they sift, sift through our interpretation. Abstract conceptualism, painting ideas directly is the heart of abstraction and it's my happy place. But non-objective art is also abstraction because it expresses inner intuition and the unfoldment of action, even though there's no noun involved. So up to now in this, in this program of mine, we've been talking about nouns, person, place, thing, or idea. We're now gonna get off of nouns and get into a little more squishy land that a lot of people think is what abstraction is, but all that other stuff is, is abstraction as well. The intention is very different. Instead of naming things first and then producing as an abstract conceptualism, for example, I decide I'm gonna paint July or I decide I'm gonna paint confidence and then I paint it. In abstract expressionism and, and non-objective art, they're just produced and then they name them later, you know, who's coming for dinner or what, you know, untitled number 52, okay? Abstract expressionism is kind of like doodling. It's, or, it's kind of like trusting being led blindfolded. It's a great way of processing mental and emotional static. It is discovery based and experimental. And in that way, it is based on ideas too, because you're having ideas as you, you happen. So it, 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 you know, you're having a conversation with a painting. Oh, I think it needs red next. There are ideas happening and not, not, not material things, but um, it's really discovery based. It's intuitive, it's deeply contemplative, which is why I like it. It is an effective form of meditation or prayer. It's a flow state that connects you with your deepest inner self, as well as being reflectively responsive to the creator of the universe. So part of the reason that I do more uh, abstract expressionism and more um, non-objective art in other materials is when you literally have flow to materials and you have a bunch of variables that you don't know how they're going to happen. Um, it lends itself more to this experimental attitude than a mark that you're going to choose. You know what color it is and you know where you're going to put it and, it, and it's um, much more definitive. So that's why I do more of these other things in other media. So having said that though, let's look at some abstract expressionism. 
The first and one is the only one in the whole show that isn't um, done in pastel, but I wanted to share it because it's a great example of abstract expressionism. My mother passed on and my son said, you should go paint because he knows that's the best way for me to deal with anything. And because my mother was a watercolorist, I took up watercolors to do this. And it was such a deep, emotional, contemplative time. I swear I was healed of grief painting this painting. You know, that is a true abstract expressionist work that, it, that you're involved in it that, that deeply. Wow. Here's a completely different um, wow. idea. I, um, I woke up in the middle of the night. I couldn't sleep. Ah, I was restless. Ah, I was too tired to sleep. And so I went up and I just put some pastel down and this is what came out of me. And I was too tired to sleep. And once I painted too tired to sleep, I went to sleep. <laughs> Here's, thank God it's Friday. I was like a happy, yay, week's over. I'm just gonna throw, you know, I just went, nah. And it was, this was a very quick thing, but I was, you know, I wasn't trying to do something. I was just glad it was Friday. And very similarly, I was on the side of a beautiful lake in Maine and I was on vacation and I wasn't really trying to do much, but I was happy to be there and I was floating around on the water and this is what came up. And in a similar way, I was so glad to be where I was when I painted this and it's a very mm -hmm. large one and I used very, very huge pieces of pastel, you know, those really extra big pastels on a very big canvas and I had a great time doing it. And uh, without a whole lot of forethought or intention. So that's abstract expressionism. Love it. Different than abstract expressionism is non-objective paintings. And they're often just exercises or meditations on composition or you know, trying things out. For example, I think it's a little boring, but I tried out peacock rectangles. Not my favorite. I like something with a little more substance as you might've noticed. But that's not objective. I tried around with this, played with this idea on, you know, it was a first time I had black paper for, as a pastelist. And uh, so I, I was trying something out, I'm not thrilled, but it's not objective. Like this a little more, not objective. Again, trying a color combo, seeing what I think. So a non-objective work is really, I once asked a, a non-objective artist what they think about, um, you know, when they, you know, I was trying to understand her paintings and she said, oh, as little as possible. And that's actually quite classic for a non-objective work. And unfortunately, I think a lot of people feel like um, most abstract art is non-objective and it really doesn't have any meaning, but that's where you're wrong. A lot of abstract artists are pouring themselves in deeply into everything that's behind their, their abstract work. So in summary, we have realism, which isn't realism as we, it really seems to be, even if it's a, a photorealism, because it's, it's not the thing itself. We have impressionism, which brings our own perspectives to something. And then we have abstracted objects, which are even more played with than impressionistic works. And then we have abstracted concepts that are ideas that are depicted. And then we have abstracted expressions. And then eventually we have non-objective art that's got very little tethered to any of that. But the point <laughs> I really want you to take away with it, it's all abstract. It's all abstract. Impressionism is abstract. There are degrees of abstraction. All of art is a degree of abstraction. And even the most realistic looking thing is some degree of abstraction. So if you look at Turner or something, it's abstract. You can, anybody you want to list is, we just didn't have that word, and, you know, and, and the way we define it usually with people. So I would also like to say that working within each aspect of the whole reign of abstraction from realism to non-objective art improves all the others. So even though where my heart is, is in abstract conceptualism, I still go do plein air painting. 
I still try out new ideas and putter around, you know, in, in non-objective art. I still do the whole range because then it gives me more to pull from when I really am trying to depict something. And I'll leave you with this. It really it means a lot to me. Sincerity is more successful than genius or talent. If you like something, then it's, and then it's good. If, and the basis on which you like it should be, does it reflect your mood? Does it re reflect your thinking? Is it imbued with who you are? It, does it represent your psyche or your feelings or your mood or your emotions or your, or your intentions? You know, be authentic and then your art will be good. It's not about talent. So I hope you've learned to see more abstractly, to understand abstraction better, and to like abstraction better. And I hope you want to try your hand at painting some. I'd love to hear any questions, answer any questions. I'd love it if you want to come to our workshop in the fall and uh, let me know what you need to understand better here. Thank you. Thank you, Polly. Are there any questions that anyone would like to ask directly to Polly? I'm not sure, this is Ellen. I'm not sure I have time to ask them all, but it was absolutely fantastic. I mean, I'm going, my head is exploding, which is great. I'm going to get out of share so that we can, I can see y'all's faces. What size do you like to paint in and on what medium, what um, substrate do you like to paint? Um, I paint between 12 by 12 and 30 by 40. So it's pretty big range. Um, what medium? I, I like a bunch of different things. I like uh, pastel premier. I use UART. I use LeCarte and I use Canson touch. Those are the four I use the most. I also sometimes make my own um, surface um, on gator board with a pastel grit. Thank you. Janet Barrett would like to know what kind of pastels do you prefer? Um, soft ones. <laughs> <laughs> I, I, I prefer, uh, like, give me a schminky, I'm happy. But I... I <laughs> I like Sennelier's, um, Schmecky, Terry Ludwig, um, Diane Townsend would be my first choices. I, I'm not like a Geralt person or a, or a Rembrandt person, they're too hard. Do you get, Ellen, do you get uh, your hard edges all with soft pastel? Oh yeah, <laughs> yeah, totally. Just checking. Totally. You are so informed in uh, abstract. I, I have never really done it. And now I have a new idea about doing something different. Good, good. Thank you. Well, I know that was a lot, but I think to, to share, you know, such a range, there's room for everybody and there's room for doing a whole lot. I think what one thing that happened in, in the history of abstract art is we got up to about 1910 and that was when abstract conceptualism was just starting. But then it, the art world jumped so fast once they had any kind of permission to do abstraction overtly at all, they jumped so fast to like non-objective, they didn't really explore the whole range of possibilities with abstract conceptualism at all. And there's so much room, like I love the fauves, for example, I don't know if you know fauve art, um, but you know, that was a fairly short lived thing because things were changing and they were trying things so many new things at once that there's a lot of room for us to explore the gaps between what all those uh, great people did back then. Yeah. Yeah. And you right. love, all, you I love the, the foes. F A V E S. The oh, yeah. They were painting red trees and stuff. Okay. Regis, you have a question? 
your hand raised? Yes, um, I really enjoy your presentation. I think it was great. And uh, I enjoyed your comments about your process. You come across as being very confident. And I'd like to know, uh, and tell me about your doubts, if you have any, when you paint. Okay, well, first of all, as an abstract artist, you get a pretty thick skin. Okay, because, you know, if I painted um, representational art, I would be a different kind of name probably in, in, you know, certainly the pastel world. Um, the fact that I'm doing things differently means that I have to, I, I don't, I'm not looking for recognition. I'm not looking for, um, oh, what's the word, validation, okay? So if, you're, if your goal in art is to get validation, that's why the people try to paint it just like it looks because when they get it like it looks, then they feel like they'll get validation. And if you're not looking for validation, then all of a sudden, then you're free to be yourself, right? It doesn't matter. And I always, I always preach authenticity because if we're free to be ourselves then you free the next person to be themselves. And that's, that's the world needs who we are. They don't need another replica of something that already exists. And so um, I work something until I like it. Doesn't mean I like every stage of it. And you know, a lot of things go through an ugly stage that you push out. You saw that painting that I did at the, at the pastel retreat and I painted something else over it that I like. You know, I didn't beat myself up that I didn't like that painting. I mean, I could have just thrown it away, but ah, oh, let's repurpose it. I had an idea, I pursued it. If that didn't work, no big deal. Um, so it's really who you're painting for and what your motives are and why you're painting. And for me, I'm painting to express myself. So I'm not gonna, gonna tether myself if I, my motive is to express myself. And I have ideas and I need them out and, um, and so, yeah, so there's no reason to, to hold that back because I the more I do it, the more healthier I am. The more I do it, the more vibrant my experience. So, um, you know, I'm not, I'm not living on somebody else's agreement or say so that it's valid. Does that help? Absolutely, great answer. <laughs> Thank you. Holly, Hello. Lily would like to know how you get multiple layers without smearing. Do you use fixative? Absolutely not. Fixative is the devil. No. <laughs> uh, fixative is muddies everything. And I don't like muddy in case you didn't notice. No. So how do you so get the layers? How do I get multiple layers? Well, yeah. first of all, like those things like I talked about, about that painting of July. Um, honestly, you have to have a plan. I didn't do that in layers. I, I knew where I was going to put what. I had a plan. So on the other hand, when I did obfuscation over something, I had to choose a plan that would work over that, you know, because one of the beautiful things is one layer influences the other. We use that all the time to our benefit. Mm -hmm. um, but when you know to use it to your benefit, you also can learn how to avoid it. So I, I find that I can, I can get a lot of layers of something, sure. That, that painting that I did in utero, I worked on that several different ways and wherefores before I got something I was happy with. And lots of different layers there. Do you use tools? Um, I do have a palette knife. I, I'm not against scraping off something I don't like. No. Mm. But that's the only tool I can think of really. No. Helen would like to know if you use thumbnails or sketches. I think you alluded to that. Um, only on some of the more difficult abstract conceptualist ideas, I'm really trying to play with what will best represent what I'm trying to do. Um, but for example, on, on all that, the person place thing and idea, if, uh, uh, the first set of uh, nouns, not, not generally, no. I, I mean, if I'm in a class and they're asking me to do it, I'll do it, but just between you and me, not. Because I, I want to experiment and I want to experiment in real time and I want the painting to tell me what it needs and I, it's, it's more of an ongoing conversation. I want to be inspired. I don't want to feel, you know, if I've already painted something, I'm not as interested in painting it. 
Hmm. So I, I need to you know, keep that interest up. Do you use gloves or your hands? I do use gloves. I didn't always. Hmm. Obviously, as a child, I didn't, but I have been using gloves now for about six years, maybe. A couple more. Janet Barrett wants to know, do you work with a fairly coarse grit, usually, like a 400 or? I use, for UART, I use a 400, right? Mm -hmm. On the other hand, though, I it like, and LaCarte is very gritty, but I like Cans on Touch too. And Cans on Touch doesn't have a whole lot of grit. So, for example, um, if I know something's going to be very um, immediate, what I'm going to put on there is not going to have a bunch of layers, then I'll use the Cans on Touch, and it it's really doesn't have a lot of grit. Diana would like to know Are you in the studio almost every day? Ah. Uh, yeah, I don't paint every day. I have a goal of a painting a week. So, um, for example, um, I overshot that goal in during the pandemic because um, I was had a lot of other cancellations and I didn't travel as much and stuff. But um, I do have this blog that was mentioned, and I typically put on a painting a week, and sometimes uh, a little more than that, depending. But with this last show. It was um, 2020 and 2021 paintings and I had 77 paintings in the show and they were nowhere near everything I had done for sure. So, um, but you know, it, it's not like I spent all my time painting. I do spend all my time thinking. I do spend all my time looking at the world and seeing colors in my spatulas, you know, <laughs> uh, it's like, you know, People ask you, how long did it take you to paint that? And it's like your whole life because you, you saw all that moss on the bark and you saw all those rocks and you know, it, everything comes together in that painting. So I went on countless walks before I painted that painting about women in the water and the insinuations. So there's a whole lot of thinking that goes on all the time. Um, but the, the time into painting, um, I don't know. It's, it seems very manageable. I don't push myself at all. I paint when I feel like it. It's not like I'm like, oh gosh, you better paint. You know, no, never. I only, only paint when I want to paint. <laughs> Helen wants to know if you do, she says underpinnings, but I think she means underpaintings. <laughs> Sometimes I do. Uh-huh. And it depends on, um, yeah, it depends on what, what it is. That Nexus painting had a, a bunch of, uh, uh, acrylic texture, for example, underneath it. That's why it looks like it does. And I actually put mixed media on there because um, it's debatable whether it's uh, what percentage of it is showing. Um, but I also sometimes do pan pastel as an underpainting. So for example, that one up through the meadow where we were the bug get, realizing we need to get out of the weeds and go up the hill and get out. Um, that has an underpainting that's it, it, interestingly enough it looks like it, it it's on like a gray background but actually it was a brown background that i put gray pan pastel on and it's so smooth pan pastel is so smooth it almost looks even when it's framed like it was done on gray paper ollie you you frame most of your paintings without a mat correct that is correct and do you use passe part out or do you use the spacers? Um, I use spacers. I, I don't say, I shouldn't say that. My husband used spacers. I know your I, husband does your- I have this fabulous husband that, that frames my paintings for me. He framed all 77 of those for my recent show. So he, he gets the angel award. Yeah, <laughs> it, it was a lot of work. He does a great job, by the way. Really beautiful uh, frame, framing for your paintings. I've been framing recently a lot in white um, because it, it in, in, since it doesn't have a mat, it sets it off from whatever wall that it's going on. Mm. Um, and then the other ones are exceptions. Um, some of my landscapes get gold and some of my abstractions get black. For example, that one, um, the Black Lives Matter is in a black frame. Mm. Marianne asks, she says, that painting in back of you doesn't appear to have a frame. Is that a pastel? No, it's an oil. It's a, uh, what will the harvest be? It's an aerial view of a farm. Mm. <laughs> okay. 
bad lighting though i have to say it's prettier with some light on it <laughs> can i ask you one more framing question of course um do you you what size spacers you use the clear spacers are they like 16th inch or quarter inch do you know what he uses i feel like it's a cool no an no eighth, it's not an yeah. eighth. 16. yeah i think it's an eighth eight yeah. yeah i know he said he puts it right on the glass yep yeah and i'm a big fan of ar glass that is you completely can't see that the glass is there so as a photographer i really music. hate it when you can't see the painting because of the glass ultra view or, or museum glass neither it's called ar it's anti-reflective yeah AR. Oh. cheaper than museum <laughs> the museum glass is too foggy i don't like it so it's just ar glass yes and you get it from a framer yes i use a wholesale warehouse or something in connecticut yeah I think the brand is True View. True, True View, yes. AR. Thank you very much. Perfect. Yeah, True View AR glass. Yeah. Yes. True View or Ultra View. True, True View. View. True Thank View. You. That's perfect. Did you say he uses spacers but puts it directly on the glass? He puts a spacer directly on the glass. Yes. It has an adhesive strip, I think. That yes, it does. There's a couple of times. I talked with him a little bit about it at, in Connecticut at the, the, Conne uh, the Connecticut Pastel Society show. He had a really you know, gorgeous painting there. It was beautiful. A lot of presents. Thank you. Anything else? I know I've inundated you with a lot of information. I think it's just interesting to see. I, I watch um, your photographs on uh, your blog and on Instagram. And whenever you post something, I know you're posting it because of composition. And it's just so interesting how you, you know, you, you see that immediately. I often wonder if your colors are enhanced or if that's your iPhone 10. Because my I have a they're not in, enhanced, but I have to say that I'm probably attracted to it because the color was good. Um, every once in a while, like you saw some of those, some of those examples, they're just sticks and they're stick color, you know, it's not interesting. But, you know, the reason I love those strawberries that I set down on the grass was because they were complementary colors and they popped and that's what they look like, you know. Um, but no, I don't enhance them. I get that Great. question all the time, but I think I'm just really attracted to color and yeah. contrasting color and um but you can tell in like those ice pictures not, none of that was enhanced you know so i don't know you're, you're very much a colorist <laughs> i am a colorist that's correct yep. i like color and texture and contrast and abstraction yep. and metaphysical ideas and yep <clears throat> you do one solo show a year or was that just because of the pandemic um I have been doing a solo show every year. Um, I'm not planning on one this year. I, I do already have some shows. I mean, like I'm doing a winery show, which I don't, it is a solo show, but I don't consider it a solo show because it only has 17 paintings in it. You know, so um, the solo shows are the ones that I, that I have more paintings. And what I find is an abstract artist, uh, first of all, um, I'm always the outlier in these group shows. I mean, I've been to the, the these main shows, for example, there's not much abstraction there. Um, and, you know, I my stuff looks better with its, my own stuff because it's not it's not the wackadoodle ones different, you know. So. You looked into, uh, ever attended um, Paradise City Arts in Northampton, Mass? I do not know that. No, yeah, I, I think, I think your work would be well received there. Okay. It's a um, it's a three day show. Uh, they two, do two a year, two two shows in Northampton and two shows in Marlboro, and they um, they curate the show very differently than the average art show. Great, they'd love Thank your you. work. Thank you. <laughs>
Well, I, I really want to encourage everybody to be authentic and, and, you know, don't worry about doing the done thing. I would encourage you to explore and experiment and really find out what floats your boat and do what makes your heart sing because that's what's going to be the most authentic for you to do. And, and really look at your world and see what you're drawn to and see what um, combinations really, you know, catch your attention. And if they catch your attention, there's somebody else out there that that'll, that'll be meaningful to them too. And as each one of us is free to do that, we free everybody else up to do that as well. So I, I very much as a teacher, I'm interested in bringing out each person's own voice. It's not about painting like me, for sure. It's yeah. about painting like you, and yeah. um, and having a new wheel wheelhouse with which to approach um, a set of ideas and a set of material. Holly, thank you. Your yeah. presentation was a delight, and it was done in your style, which is effusive and ebullient and beautiful <laughs> thank you now i want to ask a question can if if any of our viewers um really want to maybe could they email you with any questions that they oh, come totally, up with? totally i'm the uh, it's poly i'm polycaster at gmail.com it's really easy but um it, if you don't know how to spell it or anything it's on that uh a flyer that I handed out and feel free to sign up for my blog. It does come every day. I warn everybody. It does actually come into your email every day, but I put in the subject line what it's about. So if it's something you're not interested in that day, you don't even have to open it up. You can just delete it. I know it's a lot. Um, I tend to be a lot <laughs> no matter what I do. So, um, but you're, you're certainly welcome to, um, you know, join the blog and find me on Instagram, which is at Polycaster. And, um, and of course, we'd love to have you at the workshop. Do doing this on Zoom is just very different experience for me because I feel like I'm talking to myself, you know, in an empty room. So um, just to be able to bounce off real people in real time would be a total delight to see you there in the fall. That's is it going to be in Maine? I've, I missed the location of that. Yeah, is it in Maine? We're talking Portland. They haven't solidified it. It's September, though. Yes, in I know. Yeah. Um, so we'll get we'll get that um, solidified up in a in a month or two here and start uh, promoting it. Um, uh, Polly, if nothing else, I come away from this tonight with the with the understanding that you have learned and you've shown us how you see yes. and that you've learned to see the world around you but also the inner world of you and and you've ex you've found ways to communicate it in Good. paint which is just a delight and thank you for the permission to paint in our own way it's a total permission slip the whole thing is a permission slip this is just my examples but wouldn't we love to see all of your examples you yeah know, which would be different and you know if we could have a whole slideshow of each category with you know 12 people doing each kind of thing um yeah it's it gets really much more exciting when there's more participation and 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 i'm i'm don't want to be the only abstract person in these shows. I want you guys to come along and have fun with me. So thank you. you. Seem, just you seem to, pardon? You seem to be uh, the person that lays on the grass and looks up at the stars. <laughs> <laughs> I do a lot of that. Mm -hmm. lot thank of that. you. So dances all. in the grass. So <laughs> yeah. thank you for your generosity, Polly, and with your information and yourself. Oh, mm. thank you. Well, I really Wonderful. feel more generous in person. So I feel I'm glad any of that came across because uh, it's uh, if you actually go to my workshop page, that's one word that people keep saying is I'm very generous, but it's more it feels more real in person. So um, with regard to the workshop, it is very exercise intensive. So it's um, you're gonna 
I, I start you off. We end, we, we do we do the the kind of the, the development we just did in this in this PowerPoint in the opposite direction. So you end up doing abstract things. You don't start off there and then get more abstract. You start with with just doing exercises and you work your way there. Okay. Great. Okay, we're going to wrap up this meeting and let people go. Go. And can we um, get, Can we get a copy of the of the thing of this this workshop? Yes, once it's processed, it will be uploaded to YouTube and we will send you the link. If you don't get it within the week, please email Pastel Society of Maine at Gmail. Okay, thanks. Yep. Thank you, Terry. And if anybody right. needs a handout, um, let, let Pastel Society of Maine know. Yeah. Great. Thanks, Thank Polly. you. Thank you, Polly. Thank you here.